Lead in water, the walls, and so much black mold, a mother has to check on her kids just to make sure they're still breathing. On this episode, we're talking about military housing. This episode of Military Matters is brought to you by Navy Federal Credit Union. Navy Federal puts members first by helping them save money, make money, and enjoy peace of mind and security through personalized around-the-clock service. On average, Navy Federal members earn and save $361 more per year. You can pay no fees, get low rates, and rate discounts, plus earn cash back and grow your savings. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information. Navy Federal Credit Union. Our members are the mission. I'm Rod Rodriguez. I'm Jack Murphy. This is Military Matters. The military has been very active in promoting itself as an environment where families can grow while service members progress through their careers. For decades, on-base housing has been the cornerstone of military families across the DoD. But the question of responsibility over health and safety concerns has become an increasingly difficult problem for the military to confront. Jack Murphy unravels the issue of military housing safety and exactly who's responsible for fixing these problems. You'll be shocked to learn about the law that these privatized military housing companies are hiding behind so they don't have to fix anything and still make a profit. Privatized on-post military housing is a debacle that has spiraled from military families suffering in silence to a major concern in congressional hearings with service members and their families just recently receiving a tenant's bill of rights to offer them some protection. What do they need protection from exactly? The issues range from black mold in homes, to lead in drinking water, to faulty construction that leads to roofs collapsing. I spoke to a military dependent and a lawyer representing military families currently in litigation with the companies that have received decades long leases to build homes on military bases and charge military families rent through their basic housing allowance, giving these companies guaranteed, recession-proof, multi-generational wealth. What you're about to hear about those contracts, the health issues military families are suffering from, and their homes not being up to code, as well as the legal loopholes that these companies use to get around keeping our military families safe or facing any sort of accountability after the fact, will shock you to your core. If you think we have laws to protect military families, wait until you find out how these companies are arguing in court that no law passed after the year 1940 should apply to them. I lived at Fort Polk from 2015 until 2017 in military housing run by Corvius Military. That's Rachel Christian. So when we first moved in, it looked like this was an amazing home. They had done a turnover, looked like everything was freshly painted. They insisted that the carpet was new. Everything pretty much looked great. Within the first two weeks, we had our first leak in our house. After that, the leaks continued from into my kitchen. And then our floors started to turn different colors, which we later found out was molds up through the flooring. Our mirrors were discolored, which was the mold behind the mirrors coming through. And there's always been a a water issue at Fort Polk, but Installation Command, as well as Corvius, had put out statements saying that the water was safe to drink. After doing further testing on the water about a year and a half in, it turns out it was not safe to drink, especially for my child. So Initially, when when we accepted that lease, when we saw, we actually did not do sight unseen, which a lot of families do do at these installations where they're just signing leases prior to seeing the property. It looked great, but it was pretty quickly that we discovered there was massive issues, especially due to the leaking and the failed maintenance fixes for the leak. We had extensive mold throughout our air vents. So, I mean, it sounds like this house was just like permeated with mold like something out of a horror movie really under the floorboards behind the walls under the carpet behind the mirror oh for sure and i mean simple things like i would buy fresh fruit and put it out in a fruit bowl like most normal people do um, like bananas oranges and put it in a fruit bowl on my counter and the next day within 12 hours 
this bowl of fruit was just covered in mold as if it had been sitting out for months. And that was really my, like the cue to me that there is something very wrong here. And it turns out that the vent in my kitchen, which is where a majority of my leak was coming from, was absolutely just covered and deteriorated with mold. And the vent had been painted over so many times, I actually cut around the paint and opened the air vent to see inside. And it was, it was horrific. As you can imagine, the environmental hazards and their on-post housing were wreaking havoc on the health of Rachel and her entire family. I thought I was tired and run down because I was a new mom, but the real toll was seeing how sick my children got. So my son would stop breathing in the middle of the night and I would immediately pick him up. So basically I stayed up all night just watching him breathe. So that was a huge issue for me. I, I was less worried about my health and, and more focused on my, my kids later on. So um, after leaving the house, by the way, after leaving this home, his physical symptoms were completely alleviated. Um, he was no longer gasping for air. His gastrointestinal issues, which is linked to lead, um, completely subsided. My other child was failure to thrive while he was in the home. He did not have long-term damage due to the, to the mold or due to the lead, but it is suspected that my other child, since I was pregnant uh, when we first moved in and I drank the water, lead does cross the blood-brain barrier. So it is suspected that that was part of the the reasons um, for his autism diagnosis since his genetic testing has all come up cleared. When Rachel would try to call maintenance to correct the issue, they would blow her off. On reports, they would file the mold issues in her home as discoloration or mildew. But it became very clear that they were not capable of doing the fixes either by their skill set or because they were not allowed to per per Corvius's instructions for them. Um, They were not allowed to discuss mold. They were not allowed, everything on reports was like discoloration or written like mildew, which is mold. There's a government housing office that is supposed to help you and be your advocate. But the folks at Fort Polk who are in that office typically tend to side with housing and have told families that, oh, you know, you have tax sticking up from your carpet. Well, maybe just put your baby in a pen and don't let them climb over there. Eventually, Rachel had to take matters into her own hands in order to save her family from the mold in the walls and lead in the water. Actually, when they did the tests back in, I believe it was 2015. It was 2014. I'm sorry. It was the year before I moved there. 20% of the homes tested had higher than acceptable levels for the EPA of lead in the homes. They then were under like an alert from the EPA. They had to do testing yearly or mitigate the system to lessen the amount of lead. Well, they never did that. So they never really did anything to fix those 20% of homes. And then all of a sudden for the past few years, the lead has dropped to zero when they do these testings. I find it very concerning that those original 20% of homes, they never fixed anything in them. So those homes at North Fort specifically, which is like the higher end of Fort Polk, um, they are still drinking lead um, at higher than EPA standards. And no one has come in to fix that issue, even though they're well aware of it. Um, And the reason for that, I will say, is because when they come in to do these um, checks for the water, you're supposed to keep your faucets off or you, you know, take a sample based on what it would be like if you like, say, woke up in the morning and got a glass of water. What they're doing is running the taps for an extraordinary amount of time prior to pulling the sample, which will drop any contaminant levels that are in there because the way that you get contaminants is the water sitting in the pipe and the, uh, um, the corrosion from that. So they're doing the testing incorrectly. And so that's no wonder that the testing levels are now zero, Um, but those homes are still out there where there are higher than acceptable levels of lead and that will affect pregnant women, those with autoimmune conditions or um, any kind of compromised immune system and children. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the way you found out about the lead issue, you you did your own test, didn't you? Correct, I did because I had, he was so sick. I mean, my son would vomit 
all day long. He had other gastrointestinal issues. We were going to GI. We were seeing nutrition. We were driving four hours to go see specialists in Houston. And nobody could give me an answer of, of what was going on with my son. Well, finally, I sat down, pulled all of his medical records and read through each line. And it found out that he had higher than... So the, there is no safe level of lead in, in a child's blood. Let's just like make that very clear. Per the CDC, there should be zero lead in your blood. You should not be ingesting it. Um, and at the time, my son's lead level had um, been about a four in one of the records that we had taken. Um, and this was after he had stopped drinking the water. So w- this was not a record from the time that he had been drinking it. Um, but had been in the home. So I said, okay, well, where the, where's the lead coming from? I went and I found lead check sticks, which is like, you no, know, to check for lead paint. And then I started researching lead at Fort Polk. And I found out that there was, you know, this huge issue just a year prior to us moving in with lead in the water. And I went and bought a water test and it immediately came up that there was lead in my water. That's when Rachel made the decision to move out as soon as possible. So yeah, my only option really was to pack my kids up and go stay with family where I knew they'd be safe until we could find a different living situation. Amazingly, the sicknesses and symptoms that her children had been showing faded away quickly. When we come back from the break, I talk with a attorney who represents military families in litigation. You won't believe the bombshell he drops on me about the law these housing companies are hiding behind when we return. If you're an active duty service member, veteran, DOD civilian, or military family member, you can join Navy Federal. That means if you served in any branch of the military, doesn't have to just be the Navy, could be the Army, Marine Corps, Air Force, or Coast Guard, you can join the Navy Federal Credit Union. On average, Navy Federal members earn and save $361 more per year. You could pay no fees, get low rates and rate discounts, plus earn cash back and grow your savings. Navy Federal puts members first by helping them save money, make money, and enjoy peace of mind and security through personalized around-the-clock service. Plus, now is a great time to join. Have a large credit card balance after the holidays? Let Navy Federal Credit Union help you rebalance your priorities. Make a plan to do away with high interest credit card debt by transferring your balance to a Navy Federal credit card. With a low intro APR and no balance transfer fees, you can pick the right card to help you take back control. Visit NavyFederal.org, Navy Federal Credit Union. Our members are the mission. And now the fine print, insured by NCUA, dollar value of Navy Federal's 2019 member gift back study, 5.99 to 18% variable APR based on product type and credit where the nest up to $1 cash advance transaction fee at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Now that you've heard from a military dependent who directly experienced the ongoing problems with privatized military housing and all of the health issues associated with it, I wanted to talk to a legal expert who could describe how we got to this point. How could something like this ever even happen on our military installations and how do we fix it? Rob Mitro is a lawyer who represents a number of military families who are litigating for damages against the companies. You know, going back to the beginning of housing privatization, it started in the late 90s in 1996 um, when Congress passed the, or passed, excuse me, the Privatization Act. And the purpose of that was so that the military could get out of the housing management and bring in folks that were more qualified to manage, maintain, reconstruct military housing. It had very good intentions um, and it, it seemed very promising. And the way that process got started was that they chose several different companies and they executed what are known as 50 year leases. And what that involves is, is that the government turns over the housing to these companies for a period of 50 years. And during that 50 year term, they are supposed to maintain, renovate, um, you know, reconstruct in many cases, and it can be very profitable. So it was a win win situation. The military didn't have to, you know, maintain the housing to the same extent, and the companies had a financial incentive to do their jobs. Over time, what happened was that a whole slew of different things went wrong. After the Housing Act was passed and and these companies signed on to these 50-year leases, there was 
a, a, a very fast injection of money from the federal government. And it was it was used up rather quickly as far as we can tell. The companies um, did find this very, very profitable. What happened was is there was a huge disconnect between the executive level in these companies and what was actually happening in the housing communities. The companies contracted by the government to run military housing were huge. Thousands of employees and thousands of housing units to be maintained. According to Rob, what went wrong was that the system wasn't as reliable as they wanted it to be. The problems with houses got worse and the complaints started to rise. For one reason or another, they were not able or or didn't respond to the problems at a pace um, or at all in a lot of instances, which over the course of years led to the situation that we have now. You know, one thing that is largely overlooked, and I I have to say um, it's it's overlooked in, in the litigation because for the most part, the U.S. government hasn't been sued um, in military housing cases. But a large part of this, even though we're dealing with private housing companies, a large part of the problem that we have is because military oversight failed. When these private companies took over, the government didn't just hand over the housing and say, have at it, this is your responsibility now. There were very specific oversight roles set out in all of these agreements. The military has acknowledged that one of the biggest reasons for military housing debacles has been that their own oversight plan failed. Although the military has taken a much more active oversight role in recent years than it had before, what exactly were those oversight rules and how did they get ignored? Well, the oversight mechanisms are set out in the 50-year lease agreements and the operating agreements, the corporate agreements, if you will, with the private housing companies. The oversight responsibilities are not set out in the individual lease contracts with the military families. Those are just like standard, you know, rental agreements. And it allows the landlord, who's the private, private, uh, you know, housing company to inspect at any time. But there is no provision in the individual lease that allows the government, say, to to step in. Of course, could there be something more specific in the individual leases that allows command to come in? I think that's in the works. I think you're gonna see far more stringent government oversight in years to come. According to Mitro, there is a big disconnect between the military, the corporate executives who signed these agreements, and the maintenance crews who are supposed to service these on-post homes. Well, when you talk about disconnect, you, you think about the owner of a company, the, um, you know, the, the CEO, if you will, um, you know, sitting in his or her very nice office in a faraway place and, you know, announcing policies and telling Congress things that sound real nice and sound very appealing. Um, but the disconnect happens when those things don't actually go into practice on the military base or in the military housing. And that's exactly what happened in this instance um, in, a, in a number of different respects. You know, one of the things uh, or one of the reports that was very, very interesting was a report that Elizabeth Warren um, prepared back in 2019 after military or defective military housing became a hot topic. Rob's referring to a three month long investigation by Senator Warren's office into the military housing privatization initiative MHPI, and of the five companies with contracts to provide services to those homes. The investigation revealed the private military housing providers had set up a complicated web of subcontractors and subsidiaries that made it hard for tenants and military departments to hold companies accountable for substandard conditions in military housing and making it difficult to track revenues, profits, and the flow of funds. The report also revealed that the private military housing providers had failed to create accessible or centralized records and protocols to address complaints about military housing providers, making a comprehensive assessment and oversight of their performance difficult and complicated efforts to improve housing quality. Finally, the report showed that these private housing providers were making huge profits on their investments in military housing while taking minimal risks while the companies and their subsidiaries were receiving sizable incentive fees, even when they faced substantial quality control challenges and provided substandard housing. So when you talk about disconnect, it really started the day these arrangements were designed, um, when the contracts were signed. 
when the operating agreements um, were created. It, there's a very convoluted flow of money um, and responsibility. And the end result is even high ranking you know, officials and politicians like Senator Warren, they can't even get an answer um, to, to, to some of the problems and what's causing them and where the money's going and where it's not going. Now, as far as you know, the actual what's going on the ground disconnect, I, that that's very difficult to say. Um, you know, the, these companies, for the most part, tell Congress one thing, but what seems to happen realistically is an entire another thing. Speaking of disconnects. What these companies are claiming in litigation with military families is the 180 degree opposite of what they are telling Congress. There was a hearing a couple of weeks ago um, of a subcommittee, uh, Armed Services Subcommittee. And I spoke with several friends and colleagues after that hearing who had watched it. And, you know, they were kind of concerned because it seemed seemed pretty boring, boring, quite honestly. It seemed like they were, you know, some of the politicians and participants were just walking it in. They didn't show any of the testimony from the families that had taken place behind closed doors, which I'm sure was very telling. Um, but there were certain um, questions asked during that hearing and certain things said that I found very, very interesting. Um, at, at one point, uh, you know, about halfway through the hearing, Congresswoman Spear from California asked the three executives if they acknowledged their responsibility to comply with state and local housing laws. And all three of them responded, yes, we do acknowledge our responsibility to comply. Now, that's very interesting because at least two of those companies in, in recent litigation have taken the exact opposite approach during the litigation. Not only have they said, you know, we don't, we're not required um, to to comply with state and local housing laws, but the the courts should throw these claims out from military families. And what they're arguing is that this thing called the federal enclave doctrine um, preempts state and local housing laws on basis. The Federal Enclave Doctrine provides the federal government exclusive rights over federal territories such as military bases. Essentially, these areas would fall under federal law, not state law. So when Congresswoman Speer asked these three privatized housing executives if they acknowledged their responsibility to comply with state and local housing laws, and they said yes, their statement directly contradicted what they've claimed in court. We're not going to honor your claim because Basically, state landlord tenant laws don't apply. Um, I, I think that they should have told Congress during that hearing, we, we are not, um, we do not acknowledge our responsibility, or maybe we do in some cases, but to just simply say that we acknowledge our responsibility and then take the opposite approach during the litigation, um, I think some folks are going to have a problem with that. So I asked Rob for more information about this federal enclave law that supposedly protects these companies from being sued by military families. And that's when Metro dropped a bombshell on me. And military bases are federal enclaves. And basically what that means is, is they're located on a plot of land that, that a state, um, or in some cases, two states, have ceded to the federal government. In other words, they've turned the land over to the federal government and the federal government um, can go about running a military base on that piece of land. And the federal enclave doctrine, um, at least in the legal realm, basically says that state law that was enacted before the state turned over the land to the federal government applies on the federal enclave. However, state law that's enacted after the creation of the federal enclave does not apply. What these companies are arguing is that modern landlord tenant laws do not apply to military housing because those laws came after that land became federal territory. For example, Fort Bragg became a federal territory around 1940. So Corvius, the housing company responsible for Fort Bragg military housing, has taken the position that the only laws that apply are state laws that existed at that time when it was turned over to the federal government. 
So they don't have to abide by any tenant or housing laws passed after 1940 in the state of North Carolina. You know, really unfortunate about that is, is if you take a look at the actual leases that families sign, the actual you know, lease agreements for the homes, it specifically says in those agreements that applicable state and local laws shall apply. So any reasonable person would read that when they're you know, signing a lease for a home and think, okay, well, I'm signing a lease in North Carolina. And I know I'm on a military base, but this, but this document says that state and local law applies. But now they're, they're circling back and saying, no, oh, no, the applicable law, the applicable state law is the law as it existed in 1940. But it's not just Corvius that's taking this bizarre stance that they only have to follow laws from almost 100 years ago. You know, Lendlease and some of the other companies are taking the same approach. They're all arguing this in defense of these lawsuits. And again, I, hey, look, the defense lawyers, uh, you know, have a job to do just just like all of us. So I appreciate that they're going to argue whatever they can to defeat these claims. Um, but but that particular defense, I think, um, rubs a lot of people the wrong way. One of the problems Mitro encounters in trying to represent military families is that they are afraid to speak up. The military has a very insular culture, and families fear that their service member could be retaliated against by their chain of command. There are some people that have demonstrated great courage in stepping forward and filing these lawsuits. Um, you know, when I, when I initiated the lawsuit in, in North Carolina um, with the lawyers I'm working with there, um, we had to tell all of our clients, look, this is a very uncertain area of the law. This is going to be a very, very lengthy process, and you're going to have to wait. You will likely not be even living there anymore when, when this is decided. Um, and you might get some pushback here and there from folks, whether it be, who knows, maybe somebody in command, I hope not, um, or other people that don't necessarily support your lawsuit. And, you know, without question, my clients and, and the folks that have brought these suits across the country are very, very committed to making change. I just want people to speak up and, and feel comfortable doing it. Um, Congress needs to know, and the advocacy groups have done a, a great job, but you know, we need people to tell their story. Um, we want to hear from you. Oftentimes I tell folks when I talk with them, just because you talk with a, a lawyer or a senator or you know a representative um, or or someone in, involved in military housing, it doesn't mean you have to file a lawsuit. But your information is very very helpful because we're trying to solve the problem and make change, and it's difficult to do that unless people come forward and say, "Hey, this is what I heard. This is what I saw. This was my experience." Every little bit matters. So, you know, what I would ask people to do is even if you don't want to get involved in a lawsuit or a dispute, still pick up the phone and call someone, whether it's me um, or one of the other lawyers working on these cases and, and just, you know, tell them about your experience. Because if you if you want it kept confidential, it will be 100 100 percent confidential. I can assure you of it. It shows a pattern and we need to educate the, the politicians and we need to educate the court on just how widespread these problems have been. Jack, I don't think a lot of folks really understood the level to which these privatized housing companies had stooped to make a profit. It seems to me that the Warren findings were bad enough, but then to hear how these same companies are manipulating the interpretation of a law so that they don't have to provide the most basic of tenant and housing services, that's insane. How is Rachel and her family doing today? And what can folks do to get their own housing story out there? Things are much better for Rachel. She no longer lives on a military base. Things have gotten much better for her and her situation. Her children have developed normally and in a healthy manner. Uh, it's almost 180 degrees from what they had experienced on military housing. Uh, it was amazing how many of their symptoms and illnesses just evaporated after they left Fort Polk. Today, she engages in advocacy, 
trying to help other military families, trying to go to Congress and, and talk to her representatives in Washington, D.C. about the military housing issue and looking at ways that it can be improved. Meanwhile, Rob Mitro continues his legal practice, trying to reach out to military families who are experiencing problems, trying to get them to make reports to him, trying to litigate their issues with privatized military housing in a court of law. He's still out there. He's still working. He's still looking for other families to reach out to him in hopes that someone will listen. This episode was written and produced by Jack Murphy and Rod Rodriguez. Additional editing and sound designed by Clear Comma Studios. Executive produced by Joe Fleming. Make a plan to do away with high interest credit card debt by transferring your balance to a Navy Federal Credit Union credit card. With a low intro APR and no balance transfer fees, you can pick the right card to help you take back control. Visit NavyFederal.org, Navy Federal Credit Union. Our members are the mission. Leave us a review and a five-star rating on whatever podcast player you use. Those reviews really do help us reach a new audience. And be sure to share this podcast. We grow through word of mouth. You can find Military Matters everywhere you listen to podcasts or go to Stripes.com and click on the podcast tab. We're always free to listen to. Use promo code podcast and save 50% on your digital subscription to Stars and Stripes. You can follow us on Twitter. Jack Murphy is at Jack Murphy RGR and Rod Rodriguez is at Rod Pod Rod. I'm Rod Rodriguez. I'm Jack Murphy. We'll see you at the next episode.